Thank you. All right, I'd like to call this uh, first work session on AO 2020-116 and body-worn cameras to order. Um, let's go ahead and start with the roll call, please. Okay, Ms. Allard. Mr. Constant. Mr. Dunbar. Here. Ms. Kennedy. Here. Ms. LaFrance. Mr. Presradia. I am here. Mr. Peterson. Present. Mr. Rivera. Present. Mr. Weddleton. Here. Ms. Zolotel. Here. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so as normal, if uh, members want to get in the queue, please put yourself in the chat. If you can't access the chat, please text me. Um, all right, so I'll go ahead and turn it over to Mr. Falsey and uh, Chief Dahl for our, um, I don't think we have a formal presentation, but for our discussion. Thanks. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is Bill Falsey, the Anchorage Municipal Manager. This is now our second time to have a conversation about the ordinance that we introduced 2020-116, which would enable the Anchorage Police Department to refresh some of its most critical IT systems, and keep its in-car camera systems alive and functioning, and then respond to the community request and desire for officers to wear body-worn cameras. As we spoke last time, we just introduced uh, the ordinance and described some of its features. Um, in this second round, I think uh, we had received a request for the police department to maybe describe in a little bit more particularity what the systems are that are involved here and how we came to the place that we find ourselves in now. And then, so I'll hand it over to Chief Dahl. And then at the end of that comment, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about the mechanics of the ordinance and why it appears in the form that it does. For the most part, though, we don't have an additional formal presentation, but are here just to answer questions. And so I'll pass that with that. I'll pass the baton over to Chief Dahl. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Chief. Uh, uh, I want to note for the record really quick, uh, Chief, we've been joined by Ms. LaFrance. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just good afternoon to everyone. Uh, appreciate the time to be here and talk about this again today. And I know that um, the way that this initially started uh, was sort of centered around body worn cameras. And so that's the title uh, of this, um, this proposal at this point. But I always like to point out uh, that there are a lot more things involved than just body worn cameras. In fact, there's really kind of four main components uh, that we need and body worn cameras is just one of those. Um, the, the sort of the, the high level summary of what APD is trying to achieve is sort of a global uh, information technology strategy for all of the department's technical needs. And this is designed to uh, resolve that now, but also resolve it uh, on a, a go forward basis um, for a couple of reasons. One, is in the past we've always either bonded for uh, some of these larger projects like um, CAD RMS which is computer aided dispatch and records management system or gotten a grant for them um, an example there is the existing in-car camera system we got about a four three point three point eight or four million dollar grant from the state to acquire that system we got it in two chunks one in 2011 and one in 12 I think um, and so, you know, we, we tend to acquire a system and then, uh, it lives at its useful life. And then we have to kind of start over from scratch and, uh, find the funding and build a new system from scratch and, or add on to the existing one or whatever. Um, and, and we're, we're trying to come up with a way to not have to have kind of that boom and bust cycle all the time. The existing, uh, CAD RMS system, uh, was implemented. Uh, I think about the time that I got done with field training in 1997. So uh, it's been around almost as long as I have. Um, I'd like to think that I'm in better shape than it is. Uh, it is uh, a legacy system. It's really not supported anymore by the vendor. We sort of have, I guess what I'd call legacy support. Um, and every time that it stops working, um, we're concerned that it won't start again. And we had a couple weekends ago, uh, a sort of a system-wide outage, and 
You know, if you're not familiar with CAD RMS, let me back up just for a second. So computer aided dispatching is the, the computer system inside the 911 center that the call takers and dispatchers use to take incoming 911 calls and then send them out to uh, police officers or uh, we transfer the phone calls to fire. Um, and then records management system obviously keeps track of all of the records that we have at APD. And so that system went down, which is concerning because then the 911 center is without uh, a computer uh, dispatch system. And dispatchers were uh, using sheets of paper and pencils to take 911 calls and uh, hand them off to dispatchers and get uh, officers sent out to them, which is not ideal in a 911 center that handles around a thousand calls a day. So uh, calls for service and, and obviously far more phone calls than that. So we managed to uh, get some assistance from the vendor and we got it started again. But every time that happens, I'm concerned that we won't be able to get restarted. So the CAD RMS um, replacement is a high priority for the department. We also have a lot of different um, systems for the storing of digital evidence. And uh, I think we probably all recognize that at this point, the digital evidence that we collect is nearly as important or sometimes more important than the actual physical evidence that we collect and store, whether that be uh, digital photographs that officers take, audio recordings, video recordings, whether they're from uh, inside a police vehicle or uh, from a cell phone or something that a third party has given us. Um, all of those things are very important pieces of evidence and they're right now stored in a variety of places. We need sort of a unified system for the storing of those things, but also for the retrieval and the discovery in criminal cases. So we're able to share them with prosecuting authorities and of course defense counsel as well. Um, and so we're, we're in the process of acquiring a system to do that. Um, and then, of course, body-worn cameras, which we've talked about uh, several times in the past. And then uh, the in-car camera system, as I mentioned, is approaching, uh, it's going to be 10 years old here pretty soon. And it's probably going to, we should be looking for a replacement now so we don't get to the point that um, we're desperate for a replacement because that's never a good place to be. And so it's just, I think, an ideal time for the department to look long term, have a plan that sort of resolves all of these things um, and does it uh, does it on an ongoing basis. And I think that um, because of all the things I just said, plus the fact that most of the vendors that operate uh, and uh, and design and develop these types of systems are all moving to uh, subscription services, which is, um, I think has ups and downs, but I think the primary ups for APD are that we are, will no longer be in, in the business of trying to manage a large collection of servers uh, and, the, and of course the physical space and uh, all of the environmental conditions that they require uh, to keep all these things running. And uh, most of these uh, solutions are cloud-based now. So the server is operated by the vendor um, and that's good for us. Uh, and, and most of the hardware, whether it's the camera system hardware or hardware that goes with some of the CAD systems, uh, most of that is subscription based as well. And so we're not in the hardware management business either. We're just in the end user business and we can uh, turn our efforts to, uh, to those things. So anyway, I, I think that it at least gives a general overview. Um, I've heard... Uh, it sounded like some things popping up in the chat, so there are probably questions. I'm always happy to answer questions. Uh, so I would uh, turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chief. Chair. Just to note for the record, we've been joined by Ms. Allard. Um, did you want to speak, Mr. Falsey, before we did questions? Yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. I should have mentioned that I'm now um, scheduled for the 2 p.m. MLP Chugach Electric press conference. And so if you wouldn't mind, uh, I'd, I'd like to present just the brief remarks that I had and then uh, answer whatever questions I can, just in case I'm pressed for time and have to disappear before the work session is over. Um, so if there are no objections, I'll, I'll just uh, I'll attempt to share my screen here uh, and remind everyone where we sort of left last time. Uh, just a moment. And well, having said that, let me see if I can't pull this up correctly. 
Okay, here we go. This should work. So by way of reminder, we had introduced that this is the section of the ordinance uh, 2020 116, which has been now published on the assembly agenda and uh, available to the public on the website. Um, this is the portion of the ordinance that would actually appear on the ballot for voters. Um, it does have an unusual feature in that it is uh, styled as a special levy and a reduction of voter improved indebtedness. And it was reported on as being a bond proposition. And I hoped to make clear last time that this is actually not a bond proposition, but I understand where that confusion arises because this is an ultimately somewhat confusing uh, set of circumstances. But with that, just to clarify that part of the confusion, I thought it might be helpful just to remind, especially folks who are uh, joining by phone, uh, how our typical bond propositions work. And so I am now moving over, hopefully, onto this screen. Let's just a second here. Um, just some samples from the 2020 ballot. Um, just a moment here. So in the usual sense of things, in the usual course of things, uh, I'll remind each other uh, using an example from the ARDSA bond, Proposition 3 from 2020. Normally we say there is something that we want to buy that is a capital asset and it costs a lot of money. And so we say, may we have all the money we need to buy it. Um, that uh, comes in form of a general obligation bond. But of course, we don't immediately levy taxes to, to hire the entire amount of principle that we would need. In this circumstance, I'm showing Proposition 3 from 2020. It was $43 million for roads and storm drainage. Uh, we say, can we have that, can we incur that amount of indebtedness and then pay it off over multiple years? And we also say, uh, after we build new things, we need the amount of money that it takes to run them. So if we're building a brand new road, we need some additional operations and maintenance funds to plow that road that we just created because that didn't exist previously. And so in form, we usually go to voters and say, may we incur the general obligation and debt, and then may we pay that off slowly over time. We can only do that for capital assets. And on top of that, we usually say, and may I have whatever amount of funds I need to really run that new capital asset that I'd like to incur. What changed was that increasingly, some of the things that used to be capital assets that we would buy are no longer uh, most sensibly procured in a sale. Um, instead, we lease them. And so what that crash, we first encountered that uh, with the AFD Proposition 9 last year, where we said it was the case that we used to buy gurneys and we used to buy um, other emergency medical equipment. Now those things are offered for lease and that is better for the taxpayer in the long run as a cheaper investment and uh, also a more reliable way of running the show. And so instead of asking, can we incur a giant amount of general obligation indebtedness and pay it off over time and then have additional increment to run whatever we need, we said, can we just have the increment? And so we said, um, can we enter into these lease arrangements, the subscription service, and just get the increment rather than the indebtedness? Because we were shifting course, we also said, there was some old bonded indebtedness that voters had already approved for defibrillators that we no longer would need anymore. And so we asked if we could get rid of that. That is how you find your way to the proposition that we've put forward for the Anchorage Police Department, where similarly, we have some old voter authorization uh, in the amount of $940,000, which was supposed to refresh the computer-aided dispatching and records management systems. We were gonna buy those. Um, and the world has changed, and so we're no longer interested in buying those. Um, and instead, we would like to subscribe to that as a service as part of an overall bundle offered by the vendors now for the computer-aided dispatch, records management, in-car cameras, digital evidence management, and the body-worn cameras. Um, I think that is about all I had to offer the group today, and I'm happy to turn it over to questions either on the financing side or to the chief. As we also mentioned last go round, though, there are a lot of questions that come with standing newly in the world of body worn cameras. We'll have to have understandings of how they are to be used, how the public records implications work, how privacy implications work, um, and we have to work out some things with the unions. But the first question, really, before we start down that road, we think is do we want to buy these? Is this an investment the community wants to make? Um, and so we've teed up this proposition so we can put that question to voters. So that I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Chair. Great. Thank you, Mr. Felsey. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and go through the queue. First, we have Ms. Solitel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So 
Um, a couple of questions on the mechanics of how this might work. There are three distinct items um, in the uh, AO or the tax levy. Um, could, it, so could you talk a little bit about how each of those, if this goes on to the ballot and it's approved, what happens afterwards? What's the purchasing process? Um, the follow up or secondary question to that based on Mr. Falsey's last comments about body worn cameras is, is it possible for this uh, tax levy to be approved? The conversation um, and actual proposal for body worn cameras to come before the assembly and it not be um, approved for further purchase. Thanks. And I think I'll, uh, through the chair to assembly members, I'll tell, I'll invite the chief to give his sense of how the procurement might actually unfold both mechanically and in time. Um, to the second question, um, with bonds, when we say, may we have $43 million to construct new roads, we don't actually issue the indebtedness and or, or issue the bonds and incur the indebtedness until we're actually building the roads and we need it. So if it turns out we're only able to build $39 million of projects, um, we just don't incur the remaining $4 million. What we haven't really thought through, but which may be a, a sensible suggestion, is whether the ordinance before you can be recast as um, a levy up to an amount that is uh, as stated in the ordinance. And then uh, we could go through the procurement process and potentially say um, there will be a go no go decision on portions of the overall package. Um, and if and only if we determine that we want the whole kit and caboodle, um, then we would levy up to the whole amount of the authorized levy. Um, and, and in practice, because this is a property tax, we set it once in the spring. Um, and so that may make eminent sense because uh, if, as I think you're about to hear from the chief, we got voter authorization, we wouldn't have all of these things for the whole of 2021. And so we might not even if we're already committed to buying all of the components, we might want to not want to levy the entire amount for 2021. And so we may want to be able to say, uh, we're expecting to incur the full year cost. Uh, we're, we're only expecting it to incur a, a half year cost. And so we'll only go to half of the authorized amount or some such. So with that, um, Chief Dahl, do you have a sense of if approved by voters in an election in April, what a timeline for all of the procurement might be? Yeah, thanks Mr. Falsey for that. So. Uh, I, it, it's going to take a while. I mean, you know, when it comes to acquiring things, we are not speedy, um, which is good and bad. Uh, I, as I mentioned before, the CAD RMS system is probably the most critical need. I have a real concern that that existing system could fail and the police department would have uh, a pretty serious impact. Uh, it would have a serious impact on our operations and subsequently public safety. So we would probably move to acquire that one first. In fact, We've been attempting to do that for several years and had uh, not a lot of success. And so we're about to um, send out a request for proposal, hopefully sometime, um, well, sometime in the next week or two for a CAD RMS system. Um, as Mr. Falsey's pointed out, there is some remaining money for that, um, but the RFP process takes a while. So if I pull the trigger on an RFP today, it's going to be on the street probably for at least a month, and then we have to uh, have review all the proposals and then engage uh, the vendors in demonstrations so we can evaluate the proposals. So it takes months and months to get through that process. Uh, and so I anticipate that even if we s sent out an RFP for CAD RMS today, it would probably be 18 months before we actually turn on the system and probably six months before we actually awarded a contract and uh, and started working on the implementation. Um, and, I, and so the other systems would sort of follow along behind that, um, body-worn cameras, in-car cameras, um, the digital evidence management system, we're already, we're already working on acquiring one. So ultimately uh, the funding for that would come from this proposal uh, as well instead of general operating like it is like we're doing this year um but uh so i think that uh, Ms. alatella hopefully that answers your question but there's quite a bit of um, time involved in the acquisition process and then ultimately i should have mentioned uh 
at the end of RFP and evaluation, and when we get ready to award the contract, uh, those contracts come before the assembly for approval. Um, Mr. Chick, can I just make a quick restatement to make sure I understood all of that succinctly? Sure. Okay, so if I'm understanding you right, Chief, that um, us um, voters approving a tax levy doesn't circumvent or otherwise change your normal procurement processes and your primary priority is the CAD system, correct? Yes, ma'am, and I'm sorry that it was so long and not clear. No, that was fine. Thank you. I just want to make sure I understand. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dunbar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I have sort of one comment, one question, and I apologize. I missed the very beginning of Ms. Zalto's question, so perhaps she also asked this. Um, but Mr. Falsey had mentioned, and I think we all understand, that there are a lot of policies that go along with these body cameras, a lot of law that needs to be written about their use. I think we need to put stuff in code that deals with who has access to the footage, when and why. And that's a real, there are real thorny issues there of privacy of victims, um, the rights of the accused and the rights of the officers. Um, and not to mention, you know, the press and people like that, they could do um, public records requests. And I know that, I think, I believe that most, um, Police departments assert these are not public records, but um, regardless, uh, that process is going to take time and effort. And I'm a little worried that we will put this on the ballot and get the permission, but then not. I guess my question is, if we are unable to develop those um, those policies, or it takes us a very long time, can we hold off on that particular portion of this purchase entirely? Um, and and I would prefer that it didn't come down to a point where the assembly is rejecting, uh, you know, uh, something that had gone out to bid um, and we've got it b b before us, but rather the police department doesn't even go out and start that process until we have those, that new code in place. Um, so uh, again, I apologize if Ms. Zolotel had already uh, asked this earlier. So uh, Mr. Chair, if I can, I'll respond to that. This is Justin again. Go ahead. Thanks. So, uh, Mr. Dunbar, the short answer to your question is yes, uh, we could absolutely do that. Uh, this is, you know, as I mentioned, this is sort of broken down into four major components. Um, the CAD and the CAD RMS and the digital evidence management are the most critical. Um, and we are going to, we, we have to do those regardless. Um, this is a better way to pay for those, I think, and uh, supports them long term. Um, that I, I fully expect that um, the body-worn camera system and the in-car camera system uh, will be done after that. I think that those things could be done as two separate projects or you could do them as one project um, and, and either way would be fine. Uh, and of course we already have in-car cameras so that would just be a replacement system, not, a, not something new. Um, I think I, I wouldn't be surprised if we got a vendor for CAD RMS and that vendor uh, later came back to us and said, hey, we have a body worn camera system and or in car camera system and we will give you a really good deal if you continue to use us for those things. Um, but those would still be separate projects. And even if for some reason the two camera systems were bundled together, those would come after CAD RMS and, and digital evidence management. So, you know, I think that if there's going to be, um, as you mentioned, more work and sort of more time necessary for body-worn cameras, my preference would be to keep them as four separate projects, do body-worn cameras last. And that really wouldn't change the potential benefit that the municipality could uh, realize from using the same vendor for all of these things. Because like any other uh, technology, uh, you typically get a discount for bundling. So we could still take advantage of that even if we did these as separate projects, or we could uh, ultimately award them to, to totally separate contractors. Um, but I think all of those things are totally possible. Well, thank you, and I, I agree with that. I, I think that keeping them as four separate projects is a good approach, although I do understand that it might be some bundling. But it sort of, it brings me to my my second comment, which I guess I also could be a question for the drafters of this. You know, when, when this was first presented to us, it was, this is for body cameras, and obviously there was other stuff in there, but that was sort of the top line, um, that was the, the headline. And we, 
the way it's written right now, I believe, and the language is in, fr in front of me right now, but I'm 90% sure that body-worn cameras are the first thing in the list of things we are doing. And the way you describe it, Chief, it sounds like actually the most critical thing are a couple of the other software systems. And I, I guess what I'm getting at, two things. One is I think those things should go first because they're they're the most pressing. But also I think for the person that's reading this on the ballot, you sort of, you read body-worn cameras first, and then there's a bunch of language there about software and storage and stuff. And you sort of assume that those things are part of the body-worn camera project, that those are the back-end portions of the body-worn cameras, but they're not. They might relate to it, but they are standalone in important projects. And so I guess my question is, is it too late to restructure this ballot language a little bit to move the cameras back and move the other stuff forward to make it clear that this is these are standalone and important projects that are not, um, uh, you know, don't have to be uh, necessitated by the by the body worn cameras. Well, I, I mean, I and think that's a good cool. point. And oh, go ahead, Bill. Oh, sorry, I think we're about to say the same thing, which is that, yes, yes I mean, we absolutely have more time. Uh, the assembly pushed this into, I think, a December meeting, and <coughs> folks will remember that as long our, as proposition ordinances are passed by January, they make it to the April ballot. So there's imminent time to make amendments or to even do a substitute version. I'll say our thinking was just that, um, in some ways, this was shaped around the public conversation about body-worn cameras. And I think uh, in the main, it's presented from sort of the biggest cost item to the lower cost item. Um, but whatever folks think is, um, you know, the most fair and comprehensible, digestible way to present it to voters, I think we would have no objection to any of that. Yeah, I and think I think if I can just add on to that just a little bit, I think that part of the reason that these things kind of got wrapped together is one of the initial questions we were asked about body worn cameras was, hey, could APD do body worn cameras? And my response was, yes, but we have to do all these other things as well because we can't just add body worn cameras on to what we are already doing without addressing all these other issues. Right, and, and I understand sort of practically how that happened, but I'm wondering, you know, the, the word that Bill used was comprehensible, and I think that is what we should strive for in this ballot initiative mm -hmm. if, if this is the uh, you know, the path we take. And so I, I would, again, recommend restructuring this because, again, while it's true that the um, other upgrades are necessary but not sufficient conditions for the body-worn camera, they are also independently necessary. Right, Chief? Correct. We, we yes, want that's and correct. need to do these things regardless of whether or not body-worn cameras happen. So if that's correct. the case, I think we should reorder and maybe restructure the language a little bit in an S version that that I would, you know, I think that the administration is best situated to craft, um, but that would be a little more comprehensible uh, to the public. I certainly wouldn't object to that. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Mr. Dunbar. And um, a little bit to that point before I get to you, Mr. Gates. <clears throat> so we do the title of this is a first work session. We do have a second work session planned sometime in November uh, where we would be happy to review an S version and um, talk through that. So thank you, uh, Mr. Gates. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, um, I think that Mr. Dunbar has a great point, and uh, I wasn't going to speak to that, but I was going to speak to something that also might justify um, an S version. But first, I would comment that the way it's worded now is giving the voters an expectation and a commitment that this special tax is actually dedicated to body-worn cameras. So um, the municipality, the administration is kind of... Um, locking itself into using this tax revenue for that purpose. So there isn't any going back if this is approved, for example. But I mean, maybe that's the intent is uh, to lock in that uh, one of the purposes is to purchase body worn cameras, even though we haven't figured out all of those privacy issues and so forth. So um, I think that's an important consideration when we talk about restructuring the language. I would also note that um, the ballot proposition is establishing this as a special tax that's going to be levied annually. So this is long term. This isn't just a tax for 2021 or 2022. This is a tax from now on into the um, far into the future. That's how I'm reading this language. And uh, that brings me to uh, why I asked to speak as well. I think that uh, one thing missing here and 
I was looking through the ordinance and the AM and the C, and it does talk about increasing taxes, but it doesn't mention the tax increase limitation or the tax cap. And I think that's something very important that the voters should be aware of. This is authorizing an increase to the tax cap uh, as a special tax, the way it's worded in the ballot prop. This is a special tax, and uh, a special tax is outside the tax cap, and it increases the tax tax limitation the following year. That's according to Charter 1403B3, uh, where it mentions a special tax, and that the next year, this increase that's authorized, what, 532 per $100,000 of assessed value is uh, now increasing the tax cap the following year after this approval. So, um, and I don't see that tax cap mentioned here, so I think in S version, I mean, I highly recommend an S version mention that this will is authorizing the increase to the tax cap. Um, because in fact, it does. And uh, I guess that's one part of my question. I have a second part. Um, but if you want to respond to this about the tax cap, um, I, I, that's great. If you have a response, I'll wait for my second part. Yeah, and this is Bill Falsey. I'm happy to respond to that. I, I hope that that was not lost. Uh, we certainly parroted the language of the tax cap from the municipal charter by making clear that this would be treated as a special tax and then included the language which is in every voter approved proposition that says voter approval of this proposition authorizes additional taxes, an annual tax increase in taxes of the specified amount. And so um, that is right. I mean, the, the the notion, as I remember Fred Dyson saying, of the tax cap is if, uh, if you want additional services and it's going to cost additional money, then you have to ask for permission. And so that that's what this is. Right now, we are not doing body-worn cameras. Uh, we're uh, going to need some new way to refresh our in-car cameras because we have no way to do that. Uh, and so we are go very, I think, trans hopefully transparently going to voters and saying, if you're interested in that service, we've got to have a way to fund it. Um, and so we have presented it in this form. If there's a clear way to do that, I think we're certainly open to that. But but I will note that uh, everything that uh, Assembly Council Gates said is absolutely on point, um, and it is a feature of every bond proposition every bond proposition adds to the tax cap collections for the following year. Um, this one is different in that it is not just for the duration of the issued bonds, so it's not just 30 years, but it would be a, an annual increase. But that attends to the fact that if we get in this game, um, I don't suspect there will ever be a moment we will ever get out. So um, much like we replace the retired bonds with new bonds on an annual basis, so that the amount of roads and drainage bonds uh, above the tax cap are relatively consistent and constant. Um, if we decided that we wanted to have uh, body one cameras, in car cameras, digital evidence, computer aided dispatch, record management systems, that's going to be a forever need. And so um, you see that reflected in the way we've structured this. But certainly happy to have any and all additional conversations about that. Okay. Um, can I continue, Mr. Chair? Go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Fossey. And uh, yeah, I appreciate that you're open to uh, restructuring language a little bit to make it clearer there. Um, and then the second part uh, of my the reason I asked to speak is related to uh, budgeting. So we see this as an area wide special tax. So when the assembly does budgeting next year, if this is approved in budget for the 2022 20, budget, uh, does the assembly see this in the budget as part of the area wide meal levy? Um, is it going to be reflected somehow separately or is it just lumped together with the area wide meal levy as necessary to um, spend this tax amount on the needed costs um, and so forth? And I guess 10 years from now, I mean, how does the assembly identify in the budgeting process? And again, it's uh, part of an area-wide new levy uh, on your tax bill. It's not something separate for service area like the roads and drainage um, new levy and so forth. Uh, correct? Oh, that's a good point. And I think uh, that is a, a free variable that we have the free hand to present however we think is easiest and most useful to the community and to the assembly in the budgeting process. So we had a sort of similar conversation with the alcohol tax. So the way that appeared in the proposed 2021 budget was as a separate appendix that said, um, here's how much is 
proposed to be levied or to be raised, and here's where it is all going. I could imagine you would do something very similar in the resolution that the assembly finally ultimately passed if this were to go. Um, there, I think you would just see a single uh, entry for the area-wide mill levy, and it would be whatever mills number is required for that year. And then you see the, all of the budgets uh, for the various departments being populated, and this would show up in the Anchorage Police Department budget. So it may not, I mean, unless there is a, a clearer way to show it, I'm not sure it shows up in the resolution that the assembly passes, um, but certainly it could show up in the budget documents, and that would be a, a, an easy conversation to have with OMD. Uh, I would follow up. Sure. Uh, uh, thanks, Mr. Fossey. That makes sense. In some way, I kind of framed my question as this being area wide, but I guess it does beg the question. This special tax, it's, I guess, it appears from the ballot prop language to be area wide, but we also have the Anchorage Metropolitan Police Service area. Uh, which, as we all know, is just a little smaller, excluding areas south of McHugh Creek. Um, so this isn't going in the um, police service area. Is that what I'm hearing or understanding? Yes, that is correct. And we did have some internal conversations about that as well. The reason it appears as area-wide is for a following reason, uh, for, for several considerations. First is, that the computer-aided dispatch and records management systems are really part of the E911 system that is an area-wide function um, and has always been collected as an area-wide uh, voter-approved bond. Uh, so there's already an area-wide feature established there. Second, the balance of the municipality, uh, most of the municipality enjoys all of these services. And third, we did uh, create the area-wide highway law enforcement power. So uh, to the extent that we are doing body-worn cameras for the traffic patrol officers, the highway patrol officers, um, and refreshing the in-car camera systems, there's certainly an area-wide benefit to all of that. And then I think legally, the other bit that we realized is that um, voter approval is in fact the, the authorization as well. So to the extent that we receive an area-wide thumbs up on shall we do this, that is creating the authorization to do it as well as the authorization to actually levy the tax. Oh, great. Thanks, Mr. Fossey, for letting me pick your brain. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Ms. Zalatel. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, so, Chief, I'd like to talk a little bit more about um, the issues you guys have run into with the uh, CAD MRS or the 911 system. Um, you said the vendor was able to get it back up and running. Um, <clears throat> do we currently have a backup plan other than pen and paper if the vendor is not able to get it back up and running? Um, and does that impact any um, departments beyond police? Because I know 911 is kind of the catch all and then dispatch um, kind of diverts out from there a bit. Thanks. No, thanks. So those are good questions. Um, yes, we do have the ability to work sort of off of an emergency system, but it, there, as you can imagine, they're all interlinked because we need we need to keep the record. We need to be able to keep track of the records in a way to where we don't have multiple systems with different uh, uh, call for service records. And so the the link up can also be a vulnerability depending on how that works. That, I'm trying to parse this out of my head in a way that makes sense and is simple. Um, the short answer is yes, we do have some redundancy and backup ability, but it is um, because it is all part of the same system some of the same vulnerabilities exist. And, uh, you know, there, I mean, there still remains a chance that we can't get the system back up and we are having to, in the short term, use pencil and paper and in the intermediate term, find some other way to keep track of things. Um, the the good news, and, and this, this sounds really scary, right? Cause it's like, oh, 911 is not working. Well, the, system, the 911 system still works fine. This is just the computer-aided dispatching system. So this is, you know, and some of you have probably seen call for service reports in the past. It's the notes from the dispatcher about what people are saying when they call in, those kinds of things. Not, when this system goes down, 
911 still rings. Somebody still answers the phone. Um, a dispatcher is still talking to officers on the radio, and we are still going to calls for service. It's just all of the record keeping, which is critical, um, maybe isn't happening the way it should. But we're still responding to emergencies. So I don't know if that totally answers your question, but if I need to revisit some part of that, please let me know. No, thanks. That helps clarify things. I think there'll be a lot of questions about this as we continue to talk with the public. So I'm just wanting to test my own bits of knowledge. Thanks. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. All right. Are there uh, is there any other discussion? All right, not seeing any. Um, thank you so much, Chief. Thank you so much, Mr. Falsey. Uh, looking forward to uh, an S version uh, in the coming weeks, and we'll have our second work session, I believe, on November 20th. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and end this work session. Thanks, sir.